Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Franklin, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to talk about two geniuses, unique in their fields. I have to say that both of their arts were more visual than they were oral, so it's a little more difficult to convey them over podcasts. But I hope I can do so, so you can appreciate how brilliant they were. We're going to start out with Jonathan Winters, who died recently at the age of 87, and Jonathan Winters was easily the greatest improvisational comedian of the 20th century, one of the funniest guys ever. He was an only child out of central Ohio, a child of the Depression, played by himself a lot, made it to New York as a comedian, and no one could do more with less than Jonathan Winters. By way of introduction, here's a PBS report on how he was awarded the 1999 Mark Twain Prize for Comedy. Last night at Washington's Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, comedy stars from several generations gathered to honor an icon of their craft, Jonathan Winters. Winters was the second recipient of the center's annual Mark Twain Prize. The first was Richard Pryor last year. I played some pretty good-sized pads in my uh, career. I don't think I've ever played any thing this size and this high the chandeliers my wife said could we get one we live in a trailer he broke in with the dawn of television in the 1950s often appearing on the steve allen show and later frequented the tonight show winter's signature was his ability to improvise instantly into a multitude of characters here a prison guard come on tiger i know you're down there well we know one thing he's armed <laughs> Nobody else is like him, nor I think will anyone would ever be. And he was always sort of fiery and spontaneous. On the big screen, Winters appeared in the 1963 madcap comedy It's a Mad, 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 Mad World and Viva Max. Receiving the bust of Mark Twain at last night's ceremony, Winters was Winters. A lot of things I'd like to say. I, I thought the head would be bigger. <laughs> Earlier this week, prior to the award ceremony at the Kennedy Center, Jim Lehrer spoke to Jonathan Winters. You have always, you're considered the master of improvisation, mm -hmm. of, uh, of going with a situation right. and not doing it, everything scripted. Has that always been the way you've done it? I, uh, at every opportunity, I try to improvise because it's a great exercise for me and, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, I must be honest, uh, I'm in charge, you know, for a little while. It's a lot of fun to, to come up with something and just start, you know, with a glass. And uh, These are the little minnows. We have 16 of them in there. You can't see them. They're miniature. But they make for wonderful hors d'oeuvres, especially if you're in the poor section of town. The glass here is from Lancaster, Ohio. Some of the glass was blown in Italy during the war. It blew right out of the guy's hand. No one knew precisely what to do with him because his talents were cut out for the grind of weekly scripted television, but his comedy was perfect for late night television in the 50s and early 60s. That was Steve Allen you heard there before. And his reputation was made with Jack Parr, who loved him. Steve Allen and Jack Parr, of course, both did The Tonight Show before Johnny Carson. Here's just a snip of a famous routine where Jack Parr just gave him a stick and let him riff. The thick and thin, I have said to you that Johnny Winters is the most clever when the wind is right and the moon is full. <laughs> he's not full anymore. You know, he's, he's off the juice, you see. But he is altogether the most talented and funny man I know when he's in a good mood. And he's in a great mood tonight, and you're in for lots of fun. This is not a prepared comedian. There's nobody can do what Johnny Winters does. There isn't another Johnny Winters. There isn't even a Johnny Winters. <laughs> Anyhow, give this wonderful guy a great big hand. I love him. Johnny Winters. Do something with a stick. I want you to do a routine with a stick. You can give him anything. Well, that was a pretty good cast, wasn't it, Bob? I think we're on to something this time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Margaret. Try to swim in. <laughs> Send in those big cats. <laughs> uh, send in the smaller ones. Here's another riff he did with power as JFK during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But here, ladies and gentlemen, is a real original. There is no other Jonathan Winters, and he's the best there is. Now welcome this guy. This nut no. He's not, he, he can do the he just sounds just like the president. He has a plan to save Cuba. Listen to this. This well, is what he's telling me. My plan was this, Jack. From, uh, one Jack to another. Uh, it has been my feeling right along. And uh, I tried to get Congress to go along with me, my friends. Lyndon, 
who I saw about a year ago. We, uh, little, little short piece for National Geographic. But um, at any rate, it was my plan, has been from the very start of this whole entire situation. I've seen the photographs of the missiles and Cuba. As you can tell, I've been working on the, me I've been working on, uh, on the word Cuba. I said it is my plan to bring in people like Marlon Brando and have a, have a frigate about uh, 2,000 yards off, uh, have a, a spaceman, maybe four or five, uh, have a caveman, have a, a paper dinosaur, and to confuse these people so that they wouldn't know just what was coming off. <laughs> Naturally, my plan was turned down. It really, it really hurt me, Jack. And that's the reason I called. It's <laughs> awfully nice. Uh, but I, I, you did make a come. You must never interrupt oh. the president. He used to make up characters. His most famous was the lecherous old grandmother, Marty Fricker. Happy birthday, dear Marty. Happy birthday to you. fixed a robin's wing in flight. <laughs> I used to shine Teddy Roosevelt's glasses just before he'd take charge and go up San Juan. Long before your time, my child. Johnny Carson also loved him, and he blatantly ripped off Marty Frigert for his Aunt Blabby. Jonathan Winters didn't mind. He loved Johnny Carson, too. Here he roasts him as another character. At the end, he makes fun of Johnny Carson's penchant for divorce. Right now, Johnny, I feel like Ralph Edwards because the next man I'm going to introduce is somebody out of your past. Remember when you were a kid in public school back in Norfolk, Nebraska? Well, here's one of your old classmates, Mr. Willis Mumford. <laughs> Oh, God love you. Uh, I, uh, what's that reason? I just, I feel like a fool, uh, in these coveralls, uh, Arnold Stebler drove me around in a, <laughs> drove me around the semi-truck for the past, uh, 15 hours, and he said we were supposed to meet down to a barn, and, uh, there's a surprise for you there. <laughs> I'd, uh, go out into an open field, and, uh, we just look up and, and talk to one another and everything. And he says, you know what? I'd rather be more than anything in the world a magician. And uh, so he started magic and uh, he become, uh, he gave himself a name, the great Carsoni. And uh, he thought on that real hard. <laughs> so uh, he, he'd take a little, we didn't have no bunnies. And so he took a squirrel and dyed it white. <laughs> and uh, pulled it out. You know, and the people go, oh, that's a white squirrel. <laughs> uh, the fact that you've been able to make uh, two wives disappear. <laughs> Here he makes up a character playing against Dean Martin sitting on a plane. All improv, Dean Martin couldn't keep a straight face. Wait a minute, it's Dean Martin! Wait, I can first. Uh, see taken Mr. Well, Martin. does it look like it's taken, fella? He's rude, Margaret. Out there on the, on the television. Sweet. Booze. What time are we take them off, sweetheart? Right? Boy, they wait a great trouble. Short, hmm? <laughs> hey, little devil. <laughs> I love him to touch him on the leg a little bit. <laughs> How about a little kiss, huh? Hey, give us a little... Oh, forget it. You can't... Uh, incidentally, why don't we give you my name? I'm... I'm Howard Steffelfinger. <laughs> the American Kindling Company. Anytime you want any kindling... Lay it on me, sweetheart. <laughs> I'll give you all the sticks you need. I'm smoking one of my own sticks. <laughs> you be nice to me. I pay for your television show, believe it or not. I may not be your sponsor, but I'm folks. I'm people. Understand? Hmm? You be nice to me, boy. There are a lot of kooks on these planes, you know. Right, Margaret? Sweet woman, my fourth wife. First three were rotten. <laughs> Teenagers, all of them kids. <laughs> But fun, but fun. <laughs> My brains, you know, have been up here, but from here on down. <laughs> wow, gangbusters. <laughs> My wife now, she's 72. 
a little senile, you know, but a lot of money. <laughs> you know, when you get on in years, that's what you marry for anyway. Hey, you don't have any sauce on you, do you? I watch on it. Do you? No, I don't. Tranquilizers, anything like that to calm me down? I am nervous. You mind if I just try and read this? Hey, what are you? Mine? Are you reading one of your your television scripts, or is it a movie? That's a movie. It is a movie. Why are you been... yelling at me? I'm right next to you. I happen to be in a cannon outfit in World War II, and I would make fun of a veteran fella. <laughs> While you were doing those silly little shows, I was out there, man. Want me to tell you about it? I'm one of those heroes that likes to talk about it. <laughs> tell me about your movie. I've enjoyed most of your pictures. You played a lot of cowboy stuff, haven't you? Hmm? I imagine so. Hey, let me give you something here. <laughs> this is a good one. Hey, George, Dan, I saw him down here. Who's that down the riverbank? Looks like it's all swamp water, ain't it? <laughs> John Wayne. Clowns. <laughs> Is Edgar Buchanan? Oh. Well, you better be careful, fella. Or you're dead where you sit. Walter Brennan. <laughs> Margaret, he didn't get any of them. His greatest movie appearance was in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, where he basically stole the show from the other comedians. Here he is tearing down a gas station with Arnold Stang and Marvin Kaplan after Phil Silvers double-crossed him. What's the matter? How come I'm all tied up like this? Now listen, you just sit there and everything will be all right. Yeah, a couple of friends are going to come and take good care of what you. What friends? What are you talking about? Now listen, what's the big idea? Get this stuff off me. Turn me loose. Now take it easy, pal, because you've been sick. Who's been sick? And where's that bum with the glasses, huh? No, 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 just sit still because the doctor's going to get what help. What doctor? I don't know no doctor. What are you guys, crazy or something? Now I'm warning you, get this stuff off of me. You understand? Get watch this stuff off of me. Watch him, Ray, watch him. Oh, I'm oh, warning you. Down, I'm going to have to hit you, you again. Oh, oh, my arm, you broke my arm. Now, fellas, you keep this up. And I'm going to get sore. I mean it. Here's a tribute from Robin Williams, his comic inheritor. They played together in Mork and Mindy. Jonathan Winters is the reason I became a comedian. I remember watching him with my father. And when he was on the Jack Parr show, Jonathan was playing a great white hunter. And Jack asked him, he said, what do you hunt? And Jonathan said, I hunt squirrels. And Jack said, how do you do that? He said, I aim for their little nuts. Once upon a time, I called Jonathan my mentor. And he immediately corrected me. He said, please. He told me, I prefer Idol. Jonathan Winters is my idol. He is a true pioneer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the honor of a lifetime to stand here and present the TV Land Pioneer Award to the man without whom I probably wouldn't be standing here, myself. The many, the one, Jonathan Winters. And a tribute from another guy who knows a little bit about comedy, Carol Reiner, and the three greatest improvisers he ever saw. In my lifetime, there were three people. In the Army, I met a guy named Louis Nye. Louis Nye had the ability to come up with the craziest... He was not somebody who can put an act together, never could. But if you ask him questions, you can go on all night and make you laugh. That was the first one. And then, of course, I teamed up with Mel Brooks in 1950. I met him in an office, started asking him questions. And then the pleasure of doing The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, Johnny was on the set. And he very quietly sat there, and I asked him question after question. Just the two of us, nobody around to laugh. And I laughed. His best dramatic role was as a pool shark in a Twilight Zone episode with Jack Klugman. We played a little bit of this when we did Jack Klugman a couple of months back. The champions, the legends, they serve as a purpose, a challenge, an incentive. I don't need a challenge. Everyone needs a challenge. Someone great out of the past to say, match what I've done, boy, and make it better. That's true in all walks of life. Music, politics, sports, you name it. Me, I'm only a pool player. But I'm the best. Well, there's no question he was the best at improvisation. The saying goes that a comedian is a person who says funny things, and a comic is a person who says things funny. But Jonathan Winters talked about thinking funny is the key. I find an interesting thing with with the word funny. Comic, hilarious, uh, Pat Falls, all the things are thrown in there. A comedian, a comic, a big difference. I can make anybody funny. And I say funny. I can give you a funny look, not just Makeup, red nose on you or some eyebrows. Not just a clown thing or funny little mustache and a goatee. I can give you a strange wardrobe. Sleeves are too long, funny pants, shoes. I can give you funny things to say. And I can give you a shtick, funny a little cane or a la Charlie Chaplin kind of thing. The big thing that I can't do, I can't make you think. Thinking funny was the key. Well, we're going to close tonight with another genius, Maria Tallchief, who died recently at the age of 88. Maria Tallchief was perhaps the greatest American prima ballerina, and what was more remarkable was her heritage. 
Her father was a Native American from the Osage tribe in Oklahoma. Like Jonathan Winters, she was a child of the Depression, but she had a completely opposite upbringing. But oil was discovered on the Osage land, which made her father rich. He moved the family to Colorado Springs and then to Beverly Hills because it was obvious that Marie was a superb dancer. They went to a drugstore in Beverly Hills. He asked where a dance teacher could be found. An anonymous clerk referred the talent prodigy to Bronislava Nijinska, the sister of Vasily Nijinsky, and one of the great ballet teachers in the world. He came out because the young woman was a once-in-a-lifetime talent. She danced at the Hollywood Bowl with a young Sid Charisse. And then she moved to New York, where she joined the Ballet Russe. At the Ballet Russe in New York, she met the great choreographer George Balanchine, whom she married. It was, of course, through Balanchine that I encountered Stravinsky's music. We were in California. My parents were living in Beverly Hills, and Mr. Balanchine was there. And I was with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo at the time. And in retrospect, I assume that Balanchine was courting me because he invited me and we went in his little MG up to visit the Stravinskys, who lived above Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And he took her to Paris. Balanchine didn't get along with the people in Paris, so he returned to New York to form the New York City Ballet, he made Miss Tallchief his prima ballerina, and he gave her her signature role in The Firebird. Here, Miss Tallchief talks about the early days of the New York City Ballet under her husband, George Balanchine, in the late 1940s. Shape, my figure, configuration, as if I had completely changed. So it wasn't that he had just, but it wasn't just legs and feet. It was everything. It was the, the, and he, he was very careful about how you use your hands, what they call port de bras, how they move, the elbow, the shoulder, the sole of the dancer. He was a poet, and he taught us how to react and to become this poetry. George choreographed my variation, I think in two days, and then the pas de deux. And it was fascinating, and none of us thought anything about, well, of course you never thought about if anything was going to be a success. I mean, you just did the best you could, and you, you yourself felt good dancing it, or Balanchine seemed pleased. And the curtain came down, and suddenly the city center sounded like a stadium after a football game, after somebody's made a touchdown. It was unbelievable. Screaming, yells of bravo, this and that, you know. And nobody had practiced any bows. We didn't know who was supposed to bow or when we were supposed to bow. It's a wonderful picture showing George and me coming out in front of the curtain at the very end to acknowledge the applause. As Balanchine said many years later to my daughter, when we danced it out here, when, when I danced it with our company out here, he said, you know, this was the first great success of the New York City Ballet. And your mother was wonderful in it. That's the first time I've ever heard George say anything nice about my dancing. Well, a couple years later, they divorced, although he remained her choreographer. Their daughter, by the way, became a well-known poet. For a time in the 50s, Maria was the highest paid prima ballerina dancer in the United States. She danced in the movie. She retired from dancing in 1965. She moved to Chicago after remarrying, and she was the director of the Chicago Lyric Ballet for six years during the 1970s. And then she and her sister was also a successful dancer, formed the Chicago City Ballet. She became a superb ballet teacher and is basically a legend in the world of ballet. Interestingly enough, ballet is dominated by the Russians, and she was pressured to change her name from Talchip to Talacheva but she was proud of Osage heritage and remained Maria Talchi. The young girl from Osage country became one of the great virtuosos of our age. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Taps. In closing, we're going to play the music from another ballet that Maria Talchi danced in the 50s. It's the Dying Swan music by Camille Saint-Saëns. It was first created for the great Pavlova. Maria danced to this as Pavlova in a 1950s Esther Williams movie. Tonight, it's our closing tribute to Maria Talchi. <laughs> Thank you.
I was a beneficiary of the great years of Balanchine, of Stravinsky, of the beginning of almost a golden age of ballet in America. <laughs> 